how about our youth come up and help us this morning? Give the youth a hand as they come to sing. All right. All the youth in the building, you want to sing, you come on. Even if you don't want to sing, come help us. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for joy. They shall cry aloud and be free. They shall glorify the name of the Lord. It's the blood of the church, the redeemed. Oh, pick up your hearts, O Zion of the Lord. Let the earth ring forth with his praise. All the children rejoice from the islands of the sea. It's the blood of the church. The redeemed, and we are in that oh. army of the Lord. We've been washed in blood, and we are calling forth. There is nothing that can stop this mighty moving force with a shout of praise, a two-edged sword. Every strong which must fall beneath our feet, every prisoner held captive must be.
it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're so thankful to each and every one of you that's come out uh, uh, to service this morning. Uh, it's good to have you, and it's good to be here. Good to, good to, just good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Looking forward to this week. And... Got a lot to praise the Lord for this morning, don't you? First time visitors here with us this morning. If you're a first time visitor, if you can, just slip up your hand. We got some ushers with a visitor's card that we'd like for you to fill out and drop in the offering bag as it passes in just a moment. Right there in front of you, Brother Cliff. Any more first time visitors with us this morning? Anybody in the balcony? Any? Middle section, right up here, Brother Danny. Right there on your left. Any more first time visitors we've overlooked? Get them hands up high. Thank you very much for being here with us this morning. And you're our honored guest. And we hope to love on you each and each every way possible. Amen. And uh, it's just so good to be here. Good to have Dr. Grady McMurtry with us this, this morning. And he's going to be teaching on, um, on creation. And uh, you're in for a, a blessing this morning. And hopefully leave in here learning something. And uh, at this time, we're going to ask our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. Yes. Brother Roy Phillips, would you come ask the blessing over the offering for us this morning? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that's come this way this morning, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we know that you're already here visiting us this morning. Lord, you visited us during the teaching of Dr. McGrader, Lord, this morning, Lord. And we're looking forward, Lord, to what he's going to teach us here just in a few minutes, Lord. And we pray, Lord, you forgive us of all of our sins today, Lord. And if there's anything that would hinder this service today, Lord, we pray that you remove it for us, Lord. All this we ask in your name. Amen.
before the day that God would give you the sun. Blessing as it was his name, the greatest gift he did. Oh. 
God wanted me Well, the Lord's moving in this place today. Amen. Ain't God good? I'm telling you, he's, he's, as the primitive saying, God's been better than good to me. I can't, I can't even understand his mercy and grace, can you? Can't understand it. I just know I've accepted it. I'm so glad that he loves me. He loves you. No matter what state you're in today. He, he loves you and he wants to come to you. He wants to help you. He wants to restore you. He wants to regenerate you. Why? Because he redeemed you. And all you got to do is just give it to him. I mean, just really praise God. I just about preached, Dr. Grady. I mean, really just give it over to him. Has anybody ever done that in the house of God? When you just couldn't go on another step, you said, I can't carry this, I can't do it. Here it is, Lord. And the Lord took all your filth, he took all your shame, he took all your stain, and he washed you in that precious blood that Dr. Grady McMurtry talked about this morning. He washed you clean. Praise God, the old devil can't get in behind that, that door where the blood has been applied. I'm glad, praise God, that Jesus lives today. The lamb is within. The blood is applied. That old death angel's coming, but I've got a safe place to hide. When God passes over, he'll not see my sin. The blood's on the outside, but the lamb is within. Hallelujah to the Lord. Can you give the Lord just some big praise right now? Oh, yes. I had a rededication right here to the Lord. He's been battling some things, but he's, boy, I'm thankful that he's listened to the Lord. He's getting closer to him. Getting separated day by day. God will do a work in your life, son, if you'll let him. You just got to let him. And be faithful. Be committed. And uh, God will do things in our lives that we never could have imagined. Well, it's good to be saved. Said all that, say that. It's good to be saved. Uh, <laughs> well, Uncle Leonard, he's 91 years old, and he's fired up this morning. Oh, I'm telling you. And, and I tell you, today it is Sunday school was, was wonderful. I, I learned some new stuff. John David, did you learn anything this morning? <laughs> I know me and Kyle was, was blown out of our shoes by the things that that uh, Dr. Grady said, and he is a missionary teacher. He is a biblical scientific creationist and apologist. And not only that, he, he works in different countries. He likes Russia. I wasn't going to tell this, but I'm going to tell it for Brother Kyle. He is a graduate from the University of Tennessee. <laughs> He's, he's covering up his, his face right now like, oh, Lord, why did he say that? <clears throat> but they, if you miss this morning, The Water's Cleaved will be a good DVD for you to get and watch about the flood, about how the dates lined up on the 17th of Nisan. Uh, I'm telling you, that will bless your heart. Uh, not only that, he goes on the 10th day, too, with the 10 plagues. He runs through those in more detail on the DVD than he did this morning. And also dinosaurs. Anybody like dinosaurs? I, I do. Uh, those big, great, fearful lizards. Um, matter of fact, I was studying a while back, and it was a Christian man that gave the word dinosaur to those prehistoric creatures. And uh, I'm so glad that Christians are involved in everything good that goes on under the sun. And... Uh, I want you to make welcome this morning uh, my friend, and he'll be yours this week, 
and support him. You pray for him. And also on his table, from two years old to adults. And that's, that's a pretty good range to be able to help people from two-year-old and up for, for you to be able to teach your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, about how that God created this world and things that go on in this world today. Would you make welcome Dr. Grady McMurtry? Thank you. Good morning. Apparently not. You guys are no more excited about this morning than those that came to Sunday school. Come on, this is the day the Lord has made. You are to rejoice in it whether you like it or not. Doesn't matter how you feel. Doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. I can assure you that's a warm day in Moscow out there. Hello. Uh, they still need caffeine. I, I think you need your. I think you need to set up a Starbucks right there in the foyer. You know. Well, let's try that one more time. Going. Good morning. That's a little more enthusiastic. I like that. Well, we had a lovely Sunday school this morning. I really like what the guy had to say. Now, there are literally 50 different subjects we do on a regular basis. This morning, of course, we can only do one. We're going to be talking about creation evangelism. Now, I'll explain all about that in a moment, but tonight we're going to be talking about the flood of Noah. We're going to talk about how the Bible is absolutely accurate. I'm going to bring in maps that you have never seen before. I'm going to show you the Bible is absolutely accurate about the details of a worldwide flood occurring approximately 4,500 years ago. You will see the proof for yourself. You don't have to believe me. I'm not going to have to convince you. You will see the physical evidence for yourself. Tomorrow night before the game, hello. <laughs> You want to be here at 7? We're going to be talking about the age of the earth. This is absolutely talking about the age of the earth, age of the universe being only 6,000 years old, exactly as the Bible says, for good scientific reasons. We're going to be sharing simple, easy to understand and remember reasons to know and be able to share with others that the earth and the universe are only 6,000 years old, as the Bible says. On Tuesday night, you're going to want to be here. And I, I will say this to you. Uh, I assure you that on Tuesday night, we're going to be talking about there's no truth to human evolution. That may seem like you're not really that concerned, but I guarantee you, if you will come and stay for the last 10 minutes, all of you will go out that door, shake my hand, and say, thank you for getting me here on a Tuesday night. But we have saved our biggest presentation for Wednesday night, because that's the one about dinosaurs. It's our biggest presentation. Y'all have got to get with it. You know, I love North Carolina. I lived here one time back in the early 70s. I lived in Greensboro, and I, I love this state. I really do. But this morning we're going to talk about creation evangelism, how you can use creation to evangelize. And, of course, dinosaurs can be considered as missionary lizards if you just think about it, you know. Uh, hello? Well, Pastor mentioned that I was uh, an apologist, a Christian apologist. We're going to talk about what that means in case you don't know and so forth. But I want you to know something. You see... I'm talking about creation this week, but I used to be an evolutionist. I used to believe it. I used to teach it. I taught it from the seventh grade to the university level. And it really, if you'll stay this week and be with us at all the sessions, you're going to find it. It's really much, much worse than that. For example, I grew up on the campus at the University of California, Berkeley. <laughs> See, those that knew what that meant, they got in there. Yeah, I actually grew up on the campus of Cal Berkeley. And I was an evolutionist. I believed it. I taught it myself until the age of 27. At the age of 27, I said, oh, look, I've been around Christians all my life. I'm not a Christian, but I've been around them and so forth. You know, when I grew up, it was hard not to know about Christianity. And, and the fact of the matter is, I simply did an analytical scholastic study and said, is Jesus telling the truth or is he a liar? It's just that simple. It didn't originate with me. It's a 2,000-year-old argument. But I decided for myself to determine whether Jesus was telling the truth or not. At the age of 27... Now, I have two doctorates, folks. I have a fair amount of analytical scholastic ability. Would you kind of agree with that? But I spent a diligent six-month study about whether Jesus was telling the truth or not. I looked at the Bible, read it for the first time. I looked at outside histories. Many historians mentioned Jesus. And, and I came to the conclusion that he was telling the truth. And if he was telling the truth, he was the Son of God. If he was, I had to accept it. Because if you're going to seek truth... If you're going to be a diligent, earnest seeker of truth, and you find truth, you must accept it whether you like it or not. Agreed? But the problem with that was it just made me a saved evolutionist. Hello? I got a problem. 
But I'm smart enough to know I got a problem. So I spent another 16 months looking at the question, did God use some kind of an evolutionary process to get to where we are today? Or was what I had learned false? That what I had learned and shared with others was not true, and that in fact God really did speak it all into existence, whole, complete, perfect, about 6,000 years ago. Although I have noticed the older I get, the older the universe gets. Uh, same thing with you, right? You know, it was easy back in 2006, 6,000 years ago. Now it's, you know, 2018, what do I do, you know? So, but we'll say about, right? But after 16 months of diligent study, looking at scientific law, natural process, reevaluating the physical evidence, I came to the conclusion that it is only 6,000 years old, and it was spoken into existence whole and complete only about 6,000 years ago. Not only because the Bible says it, though that is sufficient, but also because it's good science. Good science supports creation. Evolution is a fairy tale for adults. Hello? Yeah, yeah. And so I became what we call today a recovering public school graduate. I'll give you time to process that one. And I want to introduce you to creation evangelism. Now, please understand something, please. Sharing your faith in Christ with others is a perfectly valid, legitimate way of winning others to Christ. Did you hear me? Yes. Sharing your faith in Christ is a perfectly valid, works with some people, but it doesn't work with everybody. There are people who want answers to questions. Think with me, why is this issue we're talking about this week, especially this morning, why should this be important to you? Think with me, when you've been sharing your faith in Christ with others, perhaps, and somebody said, well, wait a minute, what about the dinosaurs? What about those millions and billions of years they talked about in school, in the movies, on radio, TV, and so forth? What about that supposed proof for human evolution? What about that stuff? And what happens if you don't know good answers to good questions? Two things are going to happen. Number one, the person you were sharing with is going to think they were right. They're not, but they're going to think they were, and they're going to become more hardened in their position. The other thing is you will shrink back, and you're going to say, well, maybe I'm not really called to evangelism because I don't know the good answers to good questions. And you might even stop entirely. What a shame that would be. You need to learn the good answers to good questions. That's why the next four nights we're going to be giving you the information you will need, simple, easy-to-understand information, I assure you. This is not ivory tower stuff but simple, easy ways to share with people to give them the answers about dinosaurs, that there never were millions and billions of years, that humans never evolved, and why, and you're going to be able to explain it to them simply and easily. You want to be here the next four nights, amen? amen. Well, at least that's eight of them, I guess, you know. <laughs> amen? amen? Oh, that's much better. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was the first creation evangelist in Christian history. As a matter of fact, he wrote a letter to the evolutionists. I'm sure you've read it. You haven't read Paul's letter to the evolutionists? Well, please open your Bibles to Paul's letter to the evolutionists, and I'll show you. You don't know where it is? Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, think with me for a moment. You know, we talk about the books of the Bible, but, but some of them are scrolls, and actually sometimes we talk about them as letters. Is that correct? And sometimes we have things inside a letter. For instance, we have sermons. We have actual sermons of the apostles. We have sermons that Jesus preached actually contained inside a letter. And sometimes there's a letter inside a letter. And Paul's letter to the evolutionists is contained inside his letter to the Romans. If you'll open up to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, let me show you Paul's letter to the evolutionists. He, Paul starts with two very, very positive statements. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to think about it this way. Paul starts off sort of like he's headed in this direction or facing this way. And he makes two very positive statements. He says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you? That was a question, folks. Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And my question to you is, are you? Oh, you're not? Well, I'm glad to hear that. Then he says, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's two things that are very important there. In God's economy, there's only two kinds of people, Jews and those that aren't Jews. Did that leave anybody out? Hello? And the word Greek that you read there can also be Gentile, but it means anybody who's not a Jew, and it refers to evolutionists. 
The Greeks were evolutionists. The Romans were evolutionists. Alexander the Great, the entire Hellenistic realm and world of Alexander the Great was an evolutionary believing world. The people of the time believed that not only did people evolve, they believed that gods evolved. And it was an evolutionary view. And think with me too, how many of you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23? The preaching of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to a Jew, but it is foolishness to a Greek a Gentile, an evolutionist. Now, why is that true? Well, think with me. The Jew knows the right father, creator God. Is that correct? They believe the Old Testament. They know the creator God of the Old Testament. And so, the preaching of Jesus Christ to a Jew is just a stumbling block to get them to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is Yeshua, HaMashiach, that he is Jesus the Christ. That's just a stumbling block. But to an evolutionist, the teaching of Jesus Christ is foolishness. I want you to think about why. Please answer this question. How do you introduce somebody to the Son of God if they don't think there's a God? Hello? How do you introduce somebody to the Son of God if they don't believe there's a Father God? That's why the preaching of Jesus Christ to an atheist, to an evolutionist, well, it's foolishness. But Paul goes on in his very positive way in the next verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And he makes these two very positive statements. But at verse 18, Paul turns 180 degrees, and from there to the end of the chapter, he uses some of the most graphic language contained in the Bible. This is one of the things I love about the Apostle Paul. He never pulled a punch. Ladies and gentlemen, as a matter of fact, looking at the crowd here and seeing the age level and so forth, how many of you remember a comic strip we used to read in the Sunday papers, uh, Joe Palooka? Come on, I should have a lot more hands than that around here. Now, where did he get his name? Remember, he was a prize fighter. He was a pugilist. That's the ancient word for prize fighter. And Paul says, we're not like pugilists. We're not like prize fighters that shadow box against the wall. When the Apostle Paul started to take a swing, he never went halfway and pulled back. Are you with me? If the Apostle Paul started to take a swing, he went all the way. And that's one of the things I love about the guy. You know, after Jesus, he's the next guy I want to meet. Yeah. Verse 18, notice he turns 180 degrees and he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, and I would add women, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, that terminology in the Greek language means to suppress the truth or to hold back the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, I spent 20 years of my life being taught by men and women who were suppressing, holding back the truth. Now, some of them did it innocently. I do want to say that. Some of them did it just to get a paycheck. Some of them were teaching me evolution, uh, just parroting what they had learned from others, which frankly is what I did originally. Uh, some of them did it just to get a paycheck. But there were those who knew it was wrong and taught it to me anyway. And they suppressed, they held back the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I think you'll agree, it is a bold statement to say that there are those who will hold back, who will suppress the truth. Is that correct? But Paul backs up his bold statement. How do we know that this is true? He says in verse 19, because... That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Every human being on earth knows there's a God. Even the greatest atheist in the world today knows that there's a God. They aren't willing to admit it, but they do know it's true. And they continue to profess it because it's what they want to believe, not because it's true, but because evolution is a faith, it is a religion. Now, again, I think it is a bold statement to say that every human being on earth knows that there is a God. And I can assure you, I minister on five continents. If you can get me an invitation to minister in Antarctica, I'll go. Hello? So far, it's only five continents. But I don't care where you go. I don't care where you go. Everybody knows there's a God. Because everybody knows there's something greater than themselves. I don't know, care whether you go to the most remote island in the Pacific. I don't care if you go to the darkest jungle in Africa. Everybody worships something. I don't care whether it's a rock, a tree, another person. It doesn't matter. Everybody worships something because everybody knows there's something greater than themselves. 
Paul tells us, God has made this manifest so that every human being on earth knows it's true. Now, again, that's a very bold statement. I think you'll agree. How does Paul back up that bold statement? He says this, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without. Now, I'm going to leave off that last word. I I know it's excuse, but I'm going to leave it off for a good reason. I'll explain. You see, the Apostle Paul wrote my biography 2,000 years ago. Hello? Yeah, I used to be an evolutionist. Today I'm a creationist. And by the way, the good news is I'm not going back. But Paul says the invisible God is made known to us through the things he has made. Is that correct? 400 years after Paul, St. Augustine of Hippo would use this as one of the five classical arguments for the existence of God. It's called the argument by design. The argument by design, that every time you see design, the human mind intrinsically knows that there had to be a designer. God has given us the intrinsic ability to know that when you see design, there had to be a designer. Hello? Now, I've only been in this building uh, since last night. We we met, Pastor and I did. Um, So, Pastor's been with me while I've been here, and he knows that I've not touched many of the things here. Uh, But for instance, uh, there's this black thing over here. Now, by convention, we call this thing a piano, right? But, uh, but I have never tested it, weighed it, felt it, smelt it, tasted it in any way whatsoever, other than to agree it does exist over there, correct? But never having touched it, felt it, smelt it, tasted it, weighed it, never tested it in any way whatsoever, what is the one thing I absolutely know about it? Well, we know it's there. We agree to that. But, but what is the one thing I absolutely know about it? Well, think with me. That could be an empty box. There may be no strings, no, no keys in there. When I saw somebody up there perhaps moving their hands around, it might have just been a CD. Hello? But whether that's a real piano or a fake piano, the one thing I absolutely know about it is there was a piano maker. Is that correct? Oh, I drive by on the street out here, see this building. What is the, well, what do I absolutely know, never having been in the building? I mean, it could be an empty shell. I mean, I live in Orlando, Florida. That's Hollywood East, you know. And this could just be a clever Hollywood set. There might be no chairs, no people, no furniture in here. But driving down that street, what do I know about it? Number one, there was an architect. Number two, there was a building contractor. And knowing North Carolina, there were building inspectors. Hello? Never having been in the building. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody here, I assure you. If you like modern art, that's your choice. I, I'm not criticizing you for that. But I openly admit to you, I hate modern art. To me, modern art is evolution applied to art. For instance, you go into this museum of modern art, and you see these three brass balls stacked one on top of the other, and there's a little brass sign there that says, this is Madonna and Child. Now, I cannot deny that there was not intelligence on in stacking three brass balls, one on top of the other, you know, you know? And there had to be a lot of intelligence to get somebody to buy it. Hello? Or, how about around here? You got one of the trails here in the forests around you, and, and you go by a, a clear stream one morning, and you see three rounded stones in the water in the stream. 24 hours later, you take the same trail. You, say this, you see the same three stones, but this time, they're up on the bank, stacked one on top of the other. Now, what is the one thing you absolutely know? Somebody has been there in the last 24 hours, took the stones out of the creek, put them up one on top of the other because you know stones don't crawl up one on top of another. Right? The human mind intrinsically knows the difference between randomness and design. And the invisible God is known to us through what he has made. Again, think with me. Uh, Now, based on the age of this piano, I would say it's, well, conceivable that the piano maker might still be alive. Agreed. Uh, certainly, the building here is new enough to say that the architect, builder, uh, building permit people might still be alive. They may not be, but, but it's certainly reasonable to say they might. But I have never seen them. They are absolutely invisible to me. Is that correct? But I know they existed or still exist because of the things they have left behind. And that is Paul's argument. We know the invisible God exists. Ladies and gentlemen, there is more complexity in one 
shrub outside this building than there is in this entire town. Did you hear that? You take a look at all the electrical, plumbing, all the structures, buildings, and everything else. There is more complexity in that one shrub than there is in this entire community. When you see that kind of complexity, you have to know there's a designer, creator, God. Amen. Well, that's his argument. But I said I left off this one word at the end of verse 20. So that they, the evolutionists, the atheists, are without. Now, in your Bible, it says excuse. Not a bad translation. Please don't misunderstand me. A better translation of that from the Greek would be the word defense. Defense. Now, I am a Christian apologist. Now, what is a Christian apologist? Does it mean that I go around the world doing this, that, that I go around the world and say, uh, forgive me, I'm so sorry, I'm a Christian, I, just, I, I couldn't help myself, I had to do it, I just... Is that what a Christian apologist is? You see, people think that that word apologist means apology, that I'm apologizing, but it doesn't. The best use of that word, and that is the word used in the Greek in this text, it actually should better be translated defense. What is an apologist? Someone who defends their position. Now, there's Christian apologists, there's atheist apologists too, by the way. But what does this word mean? It means this. It is a defense of your position which is so rational, reasonable, so based in logic that your defense of your position becomes an overwhelming offense. Did you hear that? It's a defense that is so rational, reasonable, so logically based. It becomes an overwhelming offense. And Paul says evolutionists ain't got one. In essence, Paul says evolutionists are defenseless. How y'all doing so far? Well, good. I'm kind of glad. Now, notice what he then says next. How can we say that this is true? Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. I love verse 22. Verse 22 is on my top 10 list of my favorite verses of the Old Testament. I just love this verse. Notice Paul says this, professing themselves to be wise. Evolutionists stand up on TV, radio, the front of classrooms and so forth, and they profess and say, oh, you've got to believe us. We know what we're talking about. We're so wise. Is that right? Yeah. But Paul says this, they profess to be wise, but they became fools. Now, listen, gentlemen, today the word fools or fool, I think you'll agree, is kind of a light term. The smartest person in this room could make a simple foolish mistake. Is that correct? You know, you're new in town. You pull up to a stop sign. You're supposed to come to a complete and total cessation of forward motion. That's the legal definition of stop. And you're supposed to make a right-hand turn in safety, correct? But instead, you stopped and went straight across the intersection. Halfway down the block, you realized you made a simple, little, foolish mistake, correct? And that's why they put steering wheels on cars, right? So you turn around and you correct your foolish little mistake, right? I mean, yeah. But the word that Paul used is far stronger than that. Ladies and gentlemen, you could read this in the Greek if you don't know Greek. Hello? What Paul really said in the Greek, he used a word which means mentally useless. Hello? Paul says they profess a great wisdom, but they became mentally useless. Now, why did they do this? Why are they mentally useless? Because they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They're evolutionists. They worship the creature rather than the creator. Is that correct? They're tree huggers. Hello. And this is exactly what Paul says. As a matter of fact, think about this. He says, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25. Why? Change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Is that right? Yeah, they're evolutionists. They're tree huggers. They're worshiping the creature, but not the creator. They stop short. And they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Now, I'd like you to think about something for just a moment. I want you to think about this as nothing but a business arrangement for just a moment. Now, this is North Carolina. I've been here many times. I used to live in the state and so forth. I think you'll agree there's a few uh, 
Well, there's a few places around here that have some old, old stores. Is that correct? And how many of you have ever gone into one of these stores that was built, say, about 1890? And there's this big old glass, you know, in the big old front door and so forth. And you walk in and there's, there's a counter on three sides of the store and shelves on the walls behind the counters. Is that correct? And down on one, one end, on that end counter, there's this monster brass cash register. Hello? Am I painting a picture here, folks? Now, I want you to think about this. Paul says they have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now, let's say that I go into one of those stores and... Uh, Brother, uh, I enjoyed our conversation earlier, so I'm going to make you the store owner, okay? So you, you own the store, right? So I come into the store, and I have a truth in my hand, and I walk down to the counter next to that cash register that you got, and I plunk it down on the counter and said, I want to buy that lie over there on the shelf. And you say, well, that's why I'm in business, right? So you take my truth and give me the lie, and I walk out of the store with a lie. Please tell me, did I make a good deal or a bad deal? I made a bad deal, right? But what if I go into the same store with a lie? I walk up to the same counter, plop it down beside that cash register and say to you, I'd like to buy the truth there on that shelf right there. And you say, well, that's what I'm in business for, right? So you take my lie, you give me the truth, and I walk out of the store with the truth. Now, please tell me, ladies and gentlemen, did I make a good deal or a bad deal? I made a good deal. Is that right? Paul says evolutionists have made a bad deal. They exchanged the truth for a lie, and that's always a bad deal. Now, from that verse to the end of the chapter, Paul uses some of the most graphic language contained in the entire Bible. I will not read the entire list. We don't have the time. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. What I am going to do is I'm going to mention four things in the order in which Paul records them, okay? What is the first thing that happens when you teach evolution in your public schools? Women become lesbians. The second thing, men become gay, homosexual. Then as you start going down the list, you will find murderer. And that means murder of all kinds, suicide, homicide, euthanasia, abortion, all forms of murder. Hello? And then as you go on down the list, you will find and disobedient to parents. Now, please tell me, in our society today, as we force evolution on our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, through the public school system, tell me, what do you see more of in our society today? Do you see more lesbians, homosexuals, murderers of all kinds, including school violence, and disobedience to parents? Is that correct? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a natural outcome of the teaching of evolution in our public schools. Hello. Amen. And I want to draw your attention to the last verse of this chapter. Notice in the last verse, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have never seen a gay rights parade. I really do. But I'll bet some of you have seen some video clips of some, haven't you? When you saw the video clips of gay rights parades, you have seen some of the most debauched things happen on the street going down the parade, correct? But how many of you noticed... On the sidewalk, on both sides of the parade, there are people applauding as the parade goes by and saying, oh, yes, this is so right. Oh, my goodness, this is great. And, uh, Paul is describing a gay rights parade 2,000 years ago in the city of Rome. There are those who are in the parade, but there are those on the curb applauding as the parade goes by and saying, oh, yes, this is just so wonderful. It's so good. It's so right. Is that correct? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the problem. Let's take a look at the solution. Would you please turn to the book of Acts 17? Acts 17, and just so happens, makes it nice and neat and convenient, we're going to start at verse 16. So Acts 17, verse 16, makes it real easy to remember these things. All of you are kind of familiar with this. I'm sure you've read it many times or heard it. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Paul is in Athens. The Holy Spirit led him over there, and he is waiting for his companions. And Paul is looking at Athens. He's looking at the city and their devoted nature to idolatry. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there were statues of all kinds in the city of Athens. There were statues to people. There were statues to things. But the city was, in truthfully, full of statues. But that is not what the word idol really means. Let me give you a better definition of the word idol. An idol means anything that stands between you and God. Hello? Amen. It doesn't matter whether it's money, title, power, another person, car, clothing. It doesn't. 
it doesn't matter. An idol is anything that stands between you and God. And Paul, yes, he was looking at the city of Athens, but what was the city of Athens? The city of Athens was the crossroads of the ancient world. Every caravan that went from Asia to Europe, Europe to Asia, went through the city of Athens. Every ship from North Africa coming out of Alexandria or, well, Phoenicia, whatever, every ship would pass through the port of Athens so that goods coming from the north, south, and going across the Mediterranean or the other way, everything went through the port of Athens. The Greeks had seen everything, ladies and gentlemen. And so Paul is looking at the city, and Athens was the ancient capital of evolution. Remember that the Romans, the Greeks, were evolutionists, believed people evolved. As a matter of fact, Anaximander, a Greek philosopher of 2,500 years ago, said, fish walked out of the water and became people. Some of you may laugh, but on uh, Tuesday night, I'm going to point out that that is exactly what evolutionists are still teaching in our public schools today. Evolutionists today still teach that fish walked out of the water, became the apes that became people. Hello? There's nothing new under the sun. I quote Ecclesiastes. The fact of the matter is that there have been evolutionists not just for hundreds of years, but for millennia. And when it says that Paul is looking around Athens and he sees their devoted nature to idolatry, he is not simply talking about the statues. He's talking about everything that keeps the Greeks, the evolutionists, from knowing the one true God. Are you with me so far? Verse 17, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout Christians or people, persons that have become God-fearers, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a busy life. I'm sure many of you feel the same way about it. You know, I'm working seven days a week. I like it. And I'm sure many of you probably have the same situation. But compare your life to how busy Paul was. What was Paul doing? On Friday night and Saturday, he was in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews about how Jesus fulfilled all the scriptures of the Old Testament, was the Jewish Messiah. He was the Christ. On Saturday night and Sunday, he was in the synagogue teaching the Christian Jews, the God-fearing Gentiles that had become Christians because the synagogue was for rent. Remember that for the first couple of hundred years, we rented the synagogue because many of the early Christians were simply Christian Jews and, and they had family members there and so forth, but they would rent the hall on Sunday because it was available. And what was he doing the other five days of the week? He was going up to people in the market, right? And he was saying, hey, friend, have you heard about this guy that God raised from the dead? You haven't? Come here. I'm going to take you down to McDonald's and buy a cup of coffee. We'll talk about it. All right. Hey, you like coffee there, right? Yeah. Pretty, pretty good, huh? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now, hello. I think he's a little busy. How about you? Yeah. And notice what happens. Verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. He went to the evolutionists and preached creation, Christ, the Father God. And these philosophers of the Greeks came to him and saying, What are you talking about? You're bringing some strange things to us here. And now, you have to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. The Greeks were the greatest gossips the world has ever known. Hello? The Greeks were the greatest gossips the world. I have biblical authority for this, by the way. I'll prove it to you. But it says that, that the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers came to Paul. Now, you have to understand, why are they the only two mentioned in the Scripture? You have to understand, there were a thousand different Greek Roman philosophies. The reason that the Epicurean and the Stoic are the only two mentioned in the Bible is because they represented both ends of Greek philosophy. There were 998 different philosophies in between. But the Epicureans represented one end of the spectrum and the Stoics the other, and there were all these others in between. This is the reason they are mentioned. Now, who are the Epicureans? These are the disciples of a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. He'd been dead for 300 years when Paul came into town. These are simply the disciples of Epicurus. But Epicurus is the Greek philosopher who taught, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. He's the man who said, you only go around once, grab it while you can. 
He's the man who said, the one who dies with the most toys still dies. Hello? He was the man who said, every sensual pleasure was good and should be taken advantage of as often as possible. Therefore, he promoted the concepts of having uh, intimate relationships with men, women, animals, etc. He was the Lucius Gusius philosopher in the Greek spectrum. But who were the Stoics? The Stoics represented the other end of the Greek spectrum of philosophy. The Stoics said no sensual pleasure was of any value whatsoever. You were not even supposed to enjoy uh, the process of getting children. Okay, when a child was born in a Stoic family, they, they permanently tattooed a frown on his face. Now, that one's not true. Uh, okay, the Stoic was the one who wouldn't, wouldn't laugh at the funniest joke they've ever heard in their life, and I'm beginning to believe that many of you are Stoics. <laughs> but they came to Paul, saying, what are you talking about? You've seen all these things. We, you, you're proclaiming strange deities. You're saying these things that we don't do. Well, think with me, what happened? Paul went into Athens, the capital of evolution. You have to remember, this is like walking into Berkeley today or Harvard today, right? And Paul took the 44 magnum of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He pointed it right straight at the Greeks. Boom! And some of the Greeks did exactly what some of you just did. They went, huh? What? What are you? Now, the Greeks were the greatest, greatest gossips the world has ever known. You have to remember something. This was the crossroads of the ancient world. Athens, they had seen everything. When you came into town, they didn't ask, what did you bring? Remember, they had seen gold, and they'd seen silks, and they'd seen spices, and they'd seen it all. What was the first question a Greek asked when you got into Athens? They didn't ask, what did you bring? The first question they asked was, what have you heard? <laughs> Are Anthony and Cleopatra still fooling around down in Egypt? You know? What's the latest news out of Rome? You know? well, are you with me? They were the greatest gossips the world has ever known. They, what you, what, what's the latest news? You know? Now, if you just had that street gossip, then you just handle that in the marketplace. But if you had that big, juicy gossip, that really, that something that really grabbed your attention and so forth, we got a, we got a special place up here in a place called Mars Hill. And that's where you go when you got the really big, juicy stuff, you know? And so they take Paul up on Mars Hill. Notice what it says here. Verse 19. And they took him and brought him up onto what is Mars Hill, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. And please notice verse 21. If you've got a good translation of the Bible handy, it should be in parentheses. This is a parenthetical statement. Notice it says in verse 1, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but... Well, either to tell or to hear some new thing. They were the greatest gossips the world has ever known, and I've got biblical authority. Is that correct? And Paul makes his defense of the creator God. Notice Paul does not preach Jesus Christ first. He preaches the Father, creator God first. Notice it says this. They take him up on top of Mars Hill. Then verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. What he said was, I've noticed you're very religious in all things. What is the root word for the word religion? It is the word bondage. The word religion is properly used when you use it this way. Oh, you know Uncle Tom. Uh, he goes and plays football every Saturday morning religiously. You know Uncle Ed, he goes fishing every Saturday morning religiously. And please tell me, ladies and gentlemen, what happens if he can't go play football and he can't go fishing? What happens for the next six days of the week? They kick the cat, kick the dog, kick the wife. Is that right? They aren't fit to live with for the next six days. Is that right? Until the next Saturday morning rolls around and he can go play football and he can go fishing. Is that right? And then God's in his heaven, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, all is well with the world, right? Why? 
because they're in bondage to football. They're in bondage to fishing. Hello? And Paul says, in essence, I've noticed you're very religious. You're too superstitious. And then he goes on to say this. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, he's talking about these statues. I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now you have to understand the difference between Christianity and Eastern religion. In Eastern religion, God doesn't love you. In Eastern religion, you have to pay off the gods. Because in Eastern religion, the gods are simply superhuman. They're just like us, but they're bigger than us. And if you don't do it right, if you don't appease them, if you don't placate them, they're going to come down and hurt you. And so they don't love you. They just want your tribute. And so Paul knows this. Paul knows the Greeks. He writes excellent Greek. He knows the Greek culture. He will quote a Greek poet here in the Bible. And so he, he talks to them about this. Now, why, why this unknown God? Well, you see, the Greeks believed that there was a God for everything, and they had pedestals with gods on them and so forth, and they had this sign to an unknown God. And what happened? As soon as they found out about a new God, they would make a statue, get a nice nameplate, put it on the, on the pedestal, and move the sign over to the next pedestal. You see, that way they had an out. You see, that way they could say, oh, don't hurt us. We just didn't know you existed. But boy, just as soon as we found out you existed, did you see that statue we made of you, man? Isn't that nice? I mean, come on, that's quality right there. And we put your name right here, right? And, but don't hurt us. We just didn't know you existed. But boy, as soon as we found out you existed, we, we put up the statue and we put up the nameplate there. And everything. Right? But notice, Paul then preaches, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he hath made of one blood all nations of men. For to dwell on... He talks about the Father, Creator, God. Is that correct? But notice, notice, go down to verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men and women everywhere to repent. Paul did not call the Greeks stupid. They were not stupid. They were highly intelligent, many of them very well educated. But they were ignorant. There's nothing wrong with the word ignorance or ignorant. We are all, every one of us in this room are ignorant of something. I truly believe this, though I am a teacher myself, I believe that I can learn something useful from even the youngest person in this room. Because every one of you knows things I don't know. Hello? I am ignorant of many things, and so are you. It's not a bad word, not a dirty word, but he tells the Greeks, you were ignorant, but now I'm here to declare the Father God to you. Is that correct? And notice this. He talks about this issue, but now commandeth all men and women everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day, and which he will judge the world in unrighteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherever he hath given assurance unto all men and all women, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Did Paul preach Jesus Christ first to these evolutionists in the capital of evolution? No. He preached to the Father Creator God first. Is that right? He established the existence of the Father Creator God and then introduced them to the Son. This is called creation evangelism. It's not the only method. It's just another method, but it's one you need to try to use in certain situations and circumstances. And ladies, please take a look, at the, gentlemen, the last verse of that chapter. When you take a look at verses 32, 33, 34. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men and women clave, meaning clung to, stayed with uh, him, and believed. And then some are mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens when you use creation evangelism? Now, again, it doesn't mean that sharing your faith isn't good and right in many situations. But in a situation where you need to use creation evangelism, there will be three results. The three results are this. Number one, there will always be those people who say, I don't care what you say, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with facts. And when they do that, they condemn themselves. Think with me for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. You will never change unless you're willing to learn. Did you hear that? 
if you're not one to learn, you'll never change. And there are those who say, I refuse to learn. I refuse to change. I don't care what you say. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. And they condemn themselves. Then there was a third who said, you know, you've got some solid arguments. This is rational, reasonable, logical. You've got some sound arguments. We're not convinced today, but, but we want to learn more about this. And they would come and seek Paul out, just like coming the next four nights. And, and they would get more information. And some of them later would believe. Not all, but, but some of them surely did. Is that right? But there was one third who said, I got it. I got it. I am willing to believe this very day. And so there are the three groups. One third said, my mind's made up. I'm not changing one third said, I'm willing to learn. I do want to learn more. I will learn more. And some of them became believers. And one third said, I got it. I got it. And they believed that very day. Now, Brother Chris is going to come up here and talk with you. But the question I have for you is this. Which of those three groups are you in today? Brother Chris, thank you, sir. As they come get a song for invitation this morning, I'd like for you to bow your heads all over the building just for a moment. I'd like for you to think about what's been taught and especially about what he, he left you with today. Some would say, I'm not changing. I'm not going to believe. Or two, I, I, I understand a little bit about that now, and, and I'd like to know more. Number three, you know what? I need to know the next step. I'm, I'm not ready for death. I'm not ready for, for eternity. And today, I'd like to make my calling and election sure. Is there someone here? Under the sound of my voice as he begins to play softly. That would just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not prepared to die. And I'd like for you to pray for me. Is there one? In the balcony, main floor, I'm not saved. Or at best, I'm not sure. Pray for me when you pray. Is there one? One anywhere. Man, woman, boy, girl. What about this now? Can you lift up your hand and say, I am saved, and I'm on my way to heaven. I'm not ashamed of it. Can you do that? Just slip it up. I know that I am. There's no doubt. God bless you today. As we go to the Lord in prayer, kind Jesus, Lord, we know in this great crowd here this morning that there's got to be people that are suffering going through things and Lord you are what they need and God for those that are saved I pray you bless them and keep them and guide them and God for those that didn't have the courage to even slip up their hand I pray that you speak to them God I pray you help them to come and God for those that need something special from you God I pray that you meet that need Lord we ask it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and all God's people said Amen let us stand to our feet all over the building Brother Tony has a, a pet scan tomorrow he's calling for the elders of the church to anoint him there is an I'll go through this world. How many of you believe that God can touch these? It's come. If you don't believe, we ask you to step out. This hand 
Has it been good to be in the house of the Lord today? Did you enjoy Dr. Grady McMurtry? I did too, I'm telling you. Uh, tonight he'll be back 6 o'clock and, uh, and also Monday through Wednesday at 7 as we go into more detail. And he, he told me to tell everybody. He said, tell them they'll be out in time for that ball game on Monday. He said, they need to come hear this. He said, I'll, I'll teach fast, and, and so please do that. Again, this morning, how, how many of you, you, you wasn't here, didn't get to hear him in Sunday school? Could I see your hands this morning? You didn't get to hear him? Phenomenal message, I'm telling you. It's back there on his table. The water's cleaved on the book of Genesis and also the book of Exodus. It is wonderful. Um, also, he's got, he's got books from two years old to adults back there that, and, and also CDs, DVDs that he, he sells to be able to go up and down the roads in America and also out of the country teaching uh, what you've heard this morning. And uh, so we hope, want you to go by and bless him real good there. Take stuff home. If you got grandkids, they got great books back there. I've already looked at them uh, for children. And um, I'm making sure that I'm 
getting enough for my little clan at home. So uh, make sure you go by there and see him tonight, 6 o'clock. Come back, come back praying. And if you know, if you know someone that, that does not believe in God as creator, then bring him. Bring her. And I, I, that's good. I had to see one of my students right there. It is so good to have you today. I'm telling you, that blesses my heart. He is in our Bible class down at, down at Murphy, and I got some more sitting over here too today. So, and and he is a bright young man. I know he, you enjoyed this morning, didn't you? <laughs> he did. We love you. Not going to keep you any longer. But tonight, six o'clock, come back. Uh, also on social media, you can share the the uh, Facebook page. Uh, with those, it's live streamed every service for people to go back, and and you you may even have a lot more. Uh, blessing and getting people to go to that that are unbelievers than even coming to the house of God. But the message has got to be out, so do your best to do that. Anything right here? All right, let's get our hands in the air. Let's exercise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May God bless you.